Welcome everyone to The Watch List, Australia's newest investor webinar series for ASX listed companies to pitch to real investors and be added to their watch lists. I know each of you carefully curates your own watch list. Some of the companies on here, on there, you have invested in and some of the companies are on there so you can keep an eye on them as potential investment opportunities. For companies, getting on your watch list is a big deal. It means they're being watched and have the chance to have you invest in them and follow their journey. The Watch List is a fortnightly webinar that has been designed to offer a broad mix of industry focus and company size to deliver the maximum opportunity for ASX listed companies to tell their story and hopefully make that leap onto a few more watch lists. Today, we're bringing some companies who I'm sure are already on your watch list and some you may want to consider to add having watched their presentation. Presenting today at DMC Mining, Kazali Resources, Fenex Resources and Lithium Australia. Each company will present, then management will be on hand to answer any questions you may have. So make sure you have questions ready of management and submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, let's get started. Our first presenter is David Sumich, Executive Chairman of DMC Mining Limited, ASX code DMM. As one of Western Australia's fastest growing junior exploration companies, DMC Mining is exploring the highly prolific Yilgarn Creighton margin, which is regarded as highly prospective for world-class deposits. With a range of exciting projects underway and holding one of the largest tenement packages in the Fraser range. David, over to you. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, attendees, for your time. Um, very pleased to give this update for DMC Mining. Um, so by way of introduction, um, well, firstly, the important notice, I'll take that as read. Uh, we will be releasing this update to the ASX uh, platform uh, today. So by way of introduction, DMC is a nickel sulphide uh, explorer. Um, we believe nickel um, will be the a uh, long-term winner in the EV, um, uh, EV uh, market uh, and the revolution that is taking place. Um, nickel is can be interchanged with cobalt, of course, um, but nothing replaces nickel's energy density. So we think WA is an excellent uh, location to be exploring. 100% of the, uh, Australia's nickel um, comes from Western Australia. Um, and so in particular, nickel sulphide, and of course, there's the downstream opportunities should there be a discovery. Um, so we have the Ravensthorpe nickel project on the margins of the Yilgarn. And our strategy is uh, uh, to explore the margins of the Yilgarn. It's been very prolific in terms of discoveries. We have the Fraser Range or Yilgarn East projects. And today I'll be mainly focusing on our new discovery uh, or new project that we've secured, I should say, the Tellen Ridge project, um, which has uh, drilling and some excellent grades that we're extremely um, excited about. So that'll be the uh, main focus of this, this company update. Um, moving on to the corporate snapshot, so by way of uh, update there, DMC listed in December 2021. We, um, we believe we've got the, the board with the prerequisite skills and experience to grow a junior. Um, we've, we've all uh, done it before, done it for, for many, many years, and we've worked uh, well together. Um, so we've kept a tight structure. We've got 46 million shares in issue. Uh, enterprise value is 2.3 million, and I guess therein lies the opportunity for shareholders at this particular point in time with this new project that we've secured um, in, in conjunction with the Ravensthorpe uh, drilling that we've we've got uh, planned. CPS has been our, our broker who did the the IPO, um, uh, and they they're strong supporters. One of the largest. Uh, uh, capital raises in the junior end of the market in Australia. Uh, that share price chart, the numbers there are a little bit small, but our share price at the moment is, or as of yesterday, 8.4 cents, so giving a market cap of $4 million. So firstly, the Ravensthorpe uh, Nickel Project, uh, as mentioned, it's, it's in a prolific, um, uh, it's in a prolific nickel uh, province. Um, the Rav8 mine I'll talk more about shortly, the Ravensthorpe nickel mine owned by First Quantum. Uh, there's, uh, in terms of critical middles, the, the uh, uh, Mount Caitlin lithium mine, um, and there's gold deposits as well. So you've got nickel search to our north, uh, medallion, 
Uh, it really is a prolific area, um, excellent area for exploring, um, well serviced by infrastructure, uh, roads and power, etc. And, and notably recently, uh, Fortescue, uh, just last August, uh, pegged uh, 5,000 square k's just to our west. And some comments there you can see on the screen in terms of the comments from, from Tuggy Forest, in terms of how underexplored, or he believes, the Ravensthorpe area is. So just a little bit more detail on, on our progress with Ravensthorpe. Um, uh, next slide, thanks, uh, David. Uh, so, so this is what we would call the first catalyst for, for the company, for DMC. Um, we've done a lot of work. We've been systematic um, in our exploration. We've got what, uh, what we're calling RAV11. So it's a, it's a high priority EM target, which is which has come about through through heli EM and then ground follow up ground moving loop and fixed loop um, uh, uh, ground mag magnetics. Um, so th this is this is a prolific area in terms of nickel. The ultra matrix uh, we know in the area are fertile. Rav8, uh, 5Ks to our northwest was was an extremely profitable mine for tectonic in its day. Uh, grades up to 3% at surface, but went down to even 5%. So these, uh, these ultra mafic units um, are traveling into for 15 kilometers, uh, going to DMC's ground. Um, we've got a very, very strong conductor. So it's, uh, and we're planning to, to drill this. It's, it's an excellent drill target. Um, in terms of the progress with that, uh, we've got there a satellite image. So, so this, the RAV11 is on Crown land. We've got a heritage agreement has completed. A lot of DMC's ground on this EL is on farming land. Uh, we've got another target RAV9 that would have been affected uh, with the recent uh, ACH, the, the uh, Cultural Heritage Act, um, whether that comes in or not. But this, this RAV11 on Crown land um, is, is, is unaffected and we anticipate to um, move through to, to drilling shortly. So that's, um, so that's a quick summary on uh, Rav, uh, Ravensorp and Rav11. So moving now to, to our Fraser Range, uh, Fraser Range projects. So in, in general, um, we, we're aware that since, I, since the Nova Bollinger discovery, there hasn't been an, a lot any world-class discoveries, the Silver Knight discovery um, uh, in the Fraser Range and of course, of course Nova. So DMC has, 100% interest on all projects. Uh, we're one of the largest or probably the largest junior explorer uh, in, in this region. Uh, it's a strategic land holding. Um, and, uh, but in particular, uh, we're very, very excited about um, this Tullin Ridge project, which is in the north area um, of, of, our, of our group of projects. Um, but we see the Fraser Range as, as possibly similar to, to, for example, the Thompson um, Nickel Belt in Canada. I mean, this took uh, 40 years to play out uh, in terms of discoveries. They'll, they'll continually getting discoveries. So we think it's not, um, could be not dissimilar to that. It's still early days yet for the, for the Fraser Range. And just because there hasn't been another discovery since NOVA doesn't mean it uh, should be neglected. Um, but again, it's looking at these crustal boundaries, these intrusive related uh, deposit uh, style that, that is looking at, and these crustal boundaries between the Yilgarn and the Albany Fraser is, is what's conducive to the style of um, discovery that, that we're looking at. Um, so a little bit more detail now that we announced to the market last week on, this, on the Tullin Ridge project and uh, really why we think it's uh, so good. So just the, the next slide. Thanks, Dave, if you don't mind, thank you. So it's um, uh, what the, the, this area is, uh, is uh, often considered, of course, it's in the Albany Fraser, but it's in, it's in the reworked Yilgarn Craton. So you've essentially got the Protozoic um, uh, geology overlaying the, the Yilgarn. And, and this is what's exciting. So this is, it's a different style to, to Nova and we think this is why it's been overlooked by previous explorers. Uh, Wynwood had it in 2015, 16. Um, they got taken over by IGO and IGO were looking for a very, very specific style of deposit, i.e. the Nova style deposit, which is more of a mafic as opposed to ultra mafic, which this is. So we're really excited about it. It's got two and a half thousand meters of drilling. There's had, um, uh, previous uh, 
um, a geocam, rock chips, and EM, uh, but essentially is is open in essentially all directions. Uh, there's two major uh, intrusive complexes: the, the Red Knight intrusive and then the T34 intrusive, um, which uh, which are essentially uh, exciting results to this point, but um, but but are un untested. So. Or just the, so the next slide then is um, the the cross section, and so th this is when we look at the lithology of this previous drilling. As I mentioned before, it's getting more ultramafic, and the exciting thing with of course ultramafic, there's there are older rocks, it's higher MGO, higher tenor, higher nickel tenor, um, and a completely different style to the to the Nova style, which is more mafic um, rock. Um, so the, these these drilling results here, you know, they, these are very wide intersections, um, good good grades of, of nickel, the 64 metres at 0.3. These grades in themselves will not be commercial. Uh, there's, there's, there is sulphide there, but not a great deal of sulphide. But of course, there's a lot of instances where there's sulphide, but no nickel. So this is, uh, we, we would expect the sulphide to be deeper, or typical of this, this style of, um, uh, this style of you know, potential deposit. Um, so as I say, it's it's we're seeing higher MGO, higher tenor um, um, uh, grades or, or, or results as we go deeper. Um, the previous uh, that the previous um, uh, uh, EM only went down to 200 to 250 meters, which is essentially not, not deep enough for for a Cambelda style nickel deposit. Um, so this that's the cross section as i say it's open at depth open uh, uh in both directions for the red knight deposit which is a north one um the next slide uh is is essentially more of the same very very wide ultra mafic um intersections um and as i say this is this is uh very exciting um for us so and the and the next slide is uh it's is magnetics and and uh you can see the the drilling 23 holes is about 15 holes drilled in the t34 which is that southern southern cluster of mag anomalies and about 10 holes drilled on on the on the northern the red knight um and and essentially some of these uh mag well there's one there the t34 one very large mag anomaly which is com completely untested uh com not drilled at all so you know, IGO walked away from this. It just, as I say, it didn't it didn't meet the Nova style, um, but certainly meets Cambelda style deposit or even other potential styles, potentially even a Julie Ma style. That this could this could fit fit the bill for that. So, and in terms of uh, just the next slide is uh, providing uh, an idea of the scale potential. There's a very large mag anomaly, 10 kilometers long, which is folded and and could easily be an extension of, of both these intrusive complexes. So it's got um, so it's got a lot of lot of uh, scale potential. Um, this this uh, project or these licenses are still in application phase. Uh, we have the heritage agreement completed for the southern portion of both licenses, but the heritage agreement hasn't been completed for the northern. Uh, portion we expect this to go through to granting uh, there's no reason why it, it wouldn't be granted um, and we have some news flow uh, on these deposits on these uh, this, this project coming out in in the short term so I'll just very quickly um, I'll just very quickly touch on the Gib River project uh, we picked this up um, just the next slide we, we picked this up uh, as, as, an, as a pegging, uh, it's, a, it's a Zambian uh, dome structure or Mississippi-style Mississippi uh, copper deposit. Um, it, it was a uh, opportunistic pegging. Uh, the board is not too sure what we will do with it. Uh, there's a lot of copper, 27 drill holes, a lot of copper there. Quite exciting, but it, the, uh, the cost of exploration are more expensive in the Kimberley region. So the board will still um, yet to decide on, on, uh, on that project. So getting to sort of more of a summary for, for DMC, um, the, uh, the summary of exploration and uh, essentially news flow for, for investors. So it's the Ravensthorpe nickel, which would be the, the first or possibly the biggest catalyst. PRW application is underway, heritage agreement completed. Uh, the Talon Ridge project, which I've spoken mainly about, uh, desktop studies, heritage agreements, and we're still 
uh, going through the data and, and there's more announcements in relation to other minerals within the lithology that we will announce um, uh, to, to the market. And then, and then there's also our other Fraser Range projects that we are, I've got uh, reprocessing and analysis of, uh, of uh, EM that has come to in the public domain. So uh, in summary for DMC, um, uh, it, it comes down to, it's just the next slide, thanks David, the final slide. Uh, so in terms of what we do and what we have and the reason to invest, it really would be a combination of what we have, which is this, this new Talon Ridge project. It's, a, it's advanced greenfields with, with the drilling that's been done. Um, and given our valuation, uh, it's attractive. It's attractive to new investors. Current EV of 2.1 million, those two factors combined is is why it would be attractive for for new investors in the dmc and with that thank you very much and i'll uh, open if to any questions thanks david um got time for a couple of questions just zoning in a little bit on talent ridge so how did you secure it and just recap the history yeah so so that so it was held by uh windward resources 2015 2016 they got taken over they had large areas in the in the fraser range taken over by igo of course the nickel was different then nickel at 2015 was about eight thousand dollars um and and igo took it over they've done nothing igo got about a hundred targets in in the fraser range so it's it's, we believe it's, and we know some of the geologists that work for for uh, for IGO, and they've got a very narrow, um, very narrow scope or range of the deposit that they're looking for. It's Nova style. This doesn't fit the bill, and so IGO have have dropped it. So we've opportunistically, um, you know, pegged it. Um, it's something that we'd like to be very competitive of in in the pegging space, um, and we're and we, we we think this is an excellent pickup. And you touched on the, the sort of changes and changing changes to the um, Aboriginal Heritage Act legislation um, that's currently operating in Western Australia. Does that have any impact on, on your business? So it, it certainly would have done. We, we think the new proposed ACH was, was essentially unworkable and a, and, a, and a terrible piece of legislation that is in and, and if it does stay in. Um, it creates uncertainty and with uncertainty comes extra time and cost. So it certainly would have affected us because predominantly at Ravensthorpe we're on farming ground and we've got an excellent relationship with the, with the one farmer, uh, very welcoming of mining, but the, but the new ACH uh, has caused doubt in, in his mind, at least as the impact of mining on his land. So uh, that was the RAV, that's the RAV9 project. So should the ACH stay, it'll definitely affect us uh, for that reason. But other than that, we don't see a, a major uh, a, a major effect if it's not on farming land. Our other projects are on uh, station land or crown land, and we're dealing with with um, uh, na uh, native title groups anyway. So it's not a other than that on farming, it's not a big deal uh, or major um, issue for us. Well, I think that uncertainty is clearly um, uh, being taken away. Uh, as it appears over over time, in in uh, in literally in the next few hours, so I think that uncertainty yes. will dissipate quickly. Which uh, for yourselves and others, uh, yes. and the other stakeholders in the industry, I think is is good news, um, and hopefully provides a workable solution. So, David, thanks very much for your presentation, and we look forward to following uh, DMC Mining uh, with interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Tara French, Managing Director of Kazali Resources ASX Code CAZ. Kazali is a Perth-based Australian diversified mineral, mineral exploration and resource development company. It has a diverse portfolio of assets throughout Australia and more recently in Canada. To talk specifically about the recently announced Canadian acquisition, I'd now like to welcome Tara. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, thanks for everyone attending today. Uh, what I'd like to do is just run through a quick brief of Kazali and who we are and then focus on our latest exciting project, which is the Sundown Lithium project. Um, and then I'll also touch base on a new acquisition that we've got in Australia as well. Our next slide, thanks, David. Please over that one, the usual disclaimer. People can read that at their leisure. Next slide, thanks.
So Kazali has been around for quite a while. They were actually floated on the ASX in 2003. Uh, by Clive Jones and the late Nathan McMahon. So Kazali is 20 years old this year, which is quite a milestone. So they've always been a diverse um, international, I guess, exploration company. We've always been based in Australia, but certainly had projects um, overseas during that lifespan. And, and we continue that journey today. Um, at the moment, we have projects based out of Western Australia. Um, one is an advanced project at Halls Creek. So that's copper, zinc and silver. At the moment um, on that project, we have an MIU, AU King. And, they, and so they've um, completed an initial mine scoping study, which was positive. And, and so we will be looking to advance that project um, with AU King in mind. Uh, the Ashburton Copper Gold Rare Earth Project uh, so this is a very large land holding in the Ashburton Basin, and we have several regional scale um, mineralised trends there with gold, copper, and also rare earths. The Lions Rare Earth Project is our most recent addition, and I'll talk to that at, at the end of this talk. And we have a couple of projects in Namibia. We have the Kayoko Project, uh, which the current focus there is lithium. We have a very large uh, soil anomaly which is 10 kilometres by 12 kilometres, so it is huge. Uh, that pro that um, project is under review at the moment um, and the, in the renewal phase. Uh, so once that, that licence has been renewed, then we can get back on the ground. The Ebenham North project is in application. Now, this is a rare earth project. We know we have carbonatites there. We know that they're mineralised um, and that project is in application. We expect that grant to be coming through soon too in the next few months. The application was actually submitted in November last year. Uh, so it is a bit of a slow process um, in processing in Namibia of new applications, but nonetheless, there's no issues with that. We touch base uh, with um, our team on the ground over there in Namibia and it has progressed through the system. So now it's just a matter of um, getting that official notification that it's gone through the process. And, and our projects in Canada. So we have uh, another carbonatite project in Ontario, which is called Carb Lake. And uh, the one I'd like to talk to you about, talk to you about today is our latest uh, project, which is the Sundown Lithium Project. And it's a pretty exciting play. So um, keen to get stuck into that. And if there's um, any other information you want on the other projects, please jump onto our, our website for more detail or, or contact me at any time. Our next slide, thanks. Yeah, next slide, thanks. Um, this is just, I guess, a little pictorial about uh, Kazali and what we do. As I mentioned, we're an exploration company. We've got a diverse portfolio of commodities, as you've seen in Australia and overseas. Uh, we're very much boots on ground, add value to our projects. I will look to advance those projects and then um, work out what's going to be the best value add for the company. And, you know, previously the company has returned that value to shareholders, which is um, a, a no mean feat by a junior. That's, that's a, a very good fit in the cap. Um, next slide, thanks. So just to our capital structure, um, another very good reason to invest in Kazali. Uh, we have a big, good business model um, and also our share price is about three and a half cents. We have cash and investments to about $6.7 million and our market cap is at about $12.8 million. So in my mind, it's a great opportunity to invest in Kazali. We have an early stage lithium project in Canada, which I'll tell you about now and um, it's perfect opportunity to get in early. We've certainly seen a number of other companies have a good run on the back of new lithium discoveries and so we certainly hope to be advancing this one as soon as we can. Next slide, thanks. There's our team, our board and management. So Clive Jones, founding, founding director of Kazali is now the chairman. Um, he's got many successes under his belt. Just to name a few, 
Um, he was founder of Bannerman and also Galan, who uh, both have um, world-class um, assets in the battery mineral space. Um, myself, I've got about um, 6 million ounces of gold discovery under my belt. So um, we are certainly keen to progress the company, making new discoveries and new successes. We've also got a very strong technical team and with a lot of corporate experience as well on the board um, to move us forward. Hopefully the slides will catch up. Um, so the Sundown Lithium Project is located in Quebec, James Bay. Next slide, thanks. Okay, here we go. Um, so this is our Sundown Lithium Project located in James Bay. This is a very large um, land holding, so we're quite pleased to, to have this in the portfolio now. So we secured 260 kilometres, square kilometres of land um, in a fantastic spot for exploration and discoveries. You know, there's some, some very large lithium deposits there already, and, and we've already seen new discoveries in this district with Patriot Battery Metals, who recently announced a resource. Um, and, and also we've seen a lot of other juniors moving into the area. And, and the reason for that is it is so underexplored for lithium. Um, you can see on our tenement package there, there's lots of little circles. So those little dots are pegmatite sightings. Uh, and the beauty about this is they've actually never been sampled for lithium. You can see the Eleanor, I think it's pronounced, Newmont Mine to the south of us, that's a gold mine. And historically, this area has been well explored for gold. Um, so therein lies the opportunity. We've got a very large land holding. We're in a great district with world-class lithium deposits. So, you know, we know it's a great opportunity for discovery. And, and the plan is just to, to get on the ground as soon as we can. Our next slide, thanks. We do know that there has been forest fires in Quebec and also across the rest of Canada, actually, which have delayed progress in the field. Nonetheless, um, we have done as much desktop target generation as we can. And so this is a bit, um, a bit of a, a complex slide, I guess. But what it does show you is basically we've reviewed all of those pegmatite sightings. Uh, we've looked at all Landsat imagery, um, all sorts of other imagery that we can get our hands on. To, to delineate pegmatites in the field. Um, we know uh, the, the geological survey have been on the ground and done some mapping here just in the last 12 months. And so they've identified a new lithium perspective design called the Gladman Suite. Um, our tenement does have a fair bit of that package in, inside of it. So um, it means that we've got perspective ground for, for um, LCT pegmatite. LTC pegmatites actually. So it's um the, the opportunity is there and um we're very keen to get on the ground. I was actually talking to our team over there this morning, early, which is late night for them. And um while we do have the chopper and we do have a team ready to go, unfortunately, due to the forest fires in the district, the fire ban is still in place. So we can't get in, even though we are scheduled to to be on the ground there at, at the end of this month. Um, we just have to keep keep discussions open with the government and find out when, when the fire ban is going to be lifted. Next slide, thanks. This is just a, a very brief timeline, of course, you know, subject to a number of things, one of which was fires and um availability of rigs down the track as well. But basically this month we completed a due diligence. Um, we've entered into the transaction with um, One Minerals. And so now we have 25% of the project um, and, and that will, um, we basically acquire another 25% each year. 
Um, we've prioritised all our targets. As soon as we can get on the ground out there, we will and conduct some surface geochemical sampling. That will give us a really good idea on where we can hone in and focus in on these uh, mineralised pegmatites. So um, subject to the approvals of that, we are looking to do either more exploration if it's required for drill targeting. Um, and then after that, obviously testing the best targets with drilling. Next slide, thanks. I'll go very briefly because I think I'm getting over time now. But um, just quite quickly, our Lions uh, Rare Earth Project. Next slide, thanks. So here we're in the Bangamal Basin. It's, uh, again, uh, a fantastic opportunity. We have a very large land holding in the district. Uh, we're centred on the Lions River Fault. Now, this is a significant structure. It is tapping the mantle. So we do know that this is essentially the plumbing system, which has um, provided the pathway for the fluids which has which um, formed the rare earth deposits at Yangibana and also at Yin. And those two deposits, um, just up the road, uh, we're in very good territory there. And there's also potential here for base metal mineralisation, uh, evidenced by the APRA deposit to the east. Uh, again, this is a, an early stage uh, Greenfields project. So there is no, um, no work being done by Kazali on this project. We're planning a field assessment at the end of this month um, to get on the ground and see, see what the next stages are, are in the exploration plan on this particular tenement package. Next slide, thanks. So just to wrap it up, um, I think Kazali is a fantastic buying opportunity at three and a half cents. We have a huge lithium play at the moment that we're about to attack in James Bay. Uh, which is, you know, full um, Canada's a tier one mining district. So it's an easy place to operate. We know we can get on the ground as soon as um, the fire bands are lifted. Uh, and we know the potential for discovery there is high. So it is an opportunity for investors to get into to a great lithium story and very, very early stages. Um, that's it from me. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks, Tara. A great presentation. And I and I should have uh, mentioned at the beginning, Tara's actually at Diggers and Dealers in Kalgoorlie at the moment. So the slight delay to slides is no doubt caused by the two and a half, three thousand people all trying to connect to their internet at the same time. So um, thank you, Tara, for uh, uh, picking that up and noting that. So um, that's where the delay did come from. A um, couple of questions for you. Despite being 20 years old, the company has a very acquisitive history. It loves uh, acquiring things, adding value, and then determining what to do to generate further value for shareholders. One of the questions, and maybe more specifically to do with the Canadian assets, what are the hurdles that you put an acquisition through to make sure it's a perfect fit for Kazali and its shareholders? Uh, I guess because Kazali has always been project generation as well. So they're always trying, we're always trying to look ahead or, you know, look at where the demand's going to be um, as far as, um, you know, what metals, what commodities should we be in. And, and in that regard, we we all sort of know the push in the green of battery mineral space, if you like. Um, so while we still very much like gold and copper, you know, long term, we still think they're, they're very good assets to have in the portfolio. And so we still do. We also think that the battery metals are, do have a great future. We know there's a high demand there. Uh, and so it makes sense for us to move into the lithium space. Um, and to secure a land holding of, the, of that size, we we're obviously always looking, David, as you know, and to secure land holding of that size, with that potential for lithium discoveries, uh, we didn't, we hadn't seen that anywhere else. So, so that's really why we launched onto that particular project. Um, we thought it was a good value project with the the upside and the scalability as well. Acquiring a project such as 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 this, um, and being a jurisdiction a reasonable distance from home, is is partnership and support and teams almost as important as the project itself? Oh, look, they, yeah, they certainly play a critical role, David, and we've got a great team on the ground over there. And also, um, you know, our partner in this one, Minerals, they've also been very supportive. Um, but our contacts on the ground are great, um, even though there's, 
you know, the time difference isn't ideal. We're, we generally up late at night or early in the morning um, to have discussions, to get updates, but but they're, they're in the thick of it, these guys, and it, it's what they do every day. So, um, you know, for me, uh, working amongst bears and uh, flying in in choppers is a little bit foreign, but for them it's their day-to-day activity, So, um, which is great. You know, they have the best safety systems in place. And, um, you know, and they're also very familiar with the territory. So so it works really well. Um, so in that regard, it's going to be a great opportunity for us to get over there on the ground with them and, and actually be a part of that first campaign. Now, given you are at Diggers and Dealers, one of the largest mining conferences globally, um, what what's the mood? What's the theme? What's everyone talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think for the first time, David, we just had a quick chat about this. There's actually more battery minerals companies here than there are gold companies. Um, You know, so that's a real uh, one for the books for Kalgoorlie, you know, um, very well known for the gold endowment up here. So the the mood is positive. Um, There's plenty of people around, you know, um, Diggers is is still uh, quite quite a great space to um, obviously catch up catch up with everyone across the industry and, and there's people come from overseas and also over east. So, so it's a really good opportunity to see, you know, what people are offering, um, a good a good potential time to do deals as well still, which is great news. Um, and, yeah, the, the, the feel on the ground is is all pretty positive so far. So that's that's the feeling I get, yeah. Well, it's only early in the uh, in the event, so uh, thank you for giving up time um, so early in the day in diggers' time. Um, appreciate it. Right company, right time. Great experience, and always thinking of how to add value for shareholders. Tara, thanks for your time. Thanks, David. Sorry about the internet. <laughs> it's a bit sketchy. No problems at all. I'd now like to introduce John Wellborn, Chairman of Fenex Resources, ASX code FEX. Fenex is a high-grade, high-margin iron ore producer with assets in the Midwest mining region of Western Australia. It also operates a unique, fully integrated mining and logistics business, and in recent times acquired the Midwest iron ore port and rail assets of Mount Gibson Iron Limited. Also coming to us live from Diggers and Dealers, John, over to you. Thanks very much, and uh, great to be beaming in from Kalgoorlie, not too far away from Phoenix's home ground in the Midwest. And uh, it's always interesting, as Tara says, to come to these meetings and get a pulse on the industry and the broader landscape of mining. And I think she has described the uh, atmosphere well here, a lot of focus on uh, energy transition and and particularly on battery metals, uh, which brings me to the exciting Uh, unique nature of Phoenix. We're a success story in the Midwest. Uh, It strikes me as interesting that in Western Australia, the state government will benefit from $13 billion this year from mining royalties. Uh, About $400 million of that will be from gold and about $900 million will be from lithium. So already battery metals uh, doubling the state government's royalty revenues um, from the gold mining industry. Iron ore will be $10 billion. It dominates the Western Australian mining scene, uh, both in terms of royalties to the state government, but also in terms of income tax, deployed capital, employment, uh, and and almost every single factor. Uh, And we're very proud at Phoenix to be a rare example of a smaller scale iron ore miner rewarding our shareholders and being very profitable. And uh, uh, it's a great privilege to be uh, on the webinar and be able to talk uh, about uh, Phoenix. Uh, quickly. So I'll get through. Next slide. Thanks. This presentation is on our website and you can read this disclosure at your leisure. Uh, A high level view of the uh, company. We have unlocked a stranded ore body in the Midwest, which is 500 kilometres from Geraldton. It's an unusually high grade deposit, a beautiful ore body uh, in situ grades in our infield drilling at the moment are 66 to 68 percent iron ore, so a very pure hematite ore body, which allows us to produce two products: a 64 percent lump product and a 63 percent fines product, which we sell at a slight premium to the 62 percent index, which is what most people refer to as the iron ore price. Uh, from inception, we built a 1.3 million ton per annum uh, production profile. Uh, we've got about five years left at Iron Ridge, 
without any extensions. Uh, but we're in a very prolific area of the Midwest with lots of other stranded iron ore bodies and having proven uh, our metal at Iron Ridge, we're looking already to springboard onto other projects of similar scale and perhaps larger production opportunities. Um, but our success to date, having recently celebrated our 3 million tonne from Iron Ridge, uh, is to continue at 1.3 million tonnes per annum. Uh, and we have a fully integrated logistics pathway. So we have our own haulage fleet. It was originally a joint venture, uh, but we now operate that as a 100% owned logistics business. And we also have our own port storage and loading facilities uh, at Geraldton Port. Uh, and that connection between our mining activity our haulage capacity and our port operations has allowed us to generate very strong profits, uh, $50 million profit in FY21 and similar $50 million profit in FY22. And we're obviously looking forward to publishing our full year profit for what has been a, another very successful year for Phoenix in FY23. Um, next slide, thanks. Little bit more about that track record. We raised $15 million from shareholders in 2019 and 2020. Uh, very short production timeline, having raised that capital to production in uh, December of 2020. Uh, and very successfully, we've repaid those shareholders with $50 million in fully frank dividends. And we've ended the financial year with $76 million in cash. So we're demonstrating that uh, we can produce a lot of cash at current iron ore prices. We've also uh, shown that we're a sustainable business in, in the volatile iron ore uh, price cycle. It's a, it's a very successful record. I'm out here at Diggers with dozens of companies presenting and hundreds of juniors showing their wares to the dealers uh, as potential diggers. And Phoenix is a really good opportunity of where investors can be rewarded by management teams that deliver. We had a feasibility study that said we could produce iron ore at $80 FOB Geraldton, and that's exactly what we delivered. Uh, and we're doing so on a, on a uh, daily and monthly basis very successfully going forward. Uh, uh, that track record allows us to spring into what is going to be a very exciting growth period. Uh, shareholders and interested people, there's a QR code on the bottom right of this screen. So if you're looking at the uh, presentation yourself later on our website or on the ASX platform, that will take you to a two minute video, which gives you a really good rundown of our mining activities, our haulage activities and our port activities. Next slide, thank you. We've recently published our June quarterly results. They give a good insight uh, as to uh, the stability of our operating performance. Six shipments during the quarter for 350,000 wet metric tonnes, which is, translates through to a dry metric tonne basis of the 1.3 million tonnes I mentioned. Really high product grades, 64.5% lump, 63.5% fines, very low impurities, very good pricing. Our CE1 cash costs, again, in, a, in an industry that's having unprecedented inflationary pressures, we reduced our C1 cash costs by more than 5%, down just below $80 FOB Geraldton. We're very proud of that number. It's meant that uh, since inception, we've averaged more than 50 Australian dollars per tonne operating margin. Then uh, that really has been discipline across our business, but particularly shows the benefit of a very important transaction for Phoenix, where we acquired the 50% of the haulage joint venture we didn't originally own. That has been an incredibly successful transaction, which is flowing through into lower costs and higher profits and huge reward for shareholders based on our existing business. Uh, and is particularly important when we look at growth. The capacity we now have as the 100% owner of that haulage business uh, is absolutely crucial to this company's uh, operating performance currently and particularly our growth plans. And it's great to see the benefit of that transaction throwing through into our quarterly numbers and it will certainly be demonstrated in our full year audited re re um, results. Average price received during the June quarter, um, more than 170 Australian dollars a tonne, demonstrating our product quality and also showing that operating margin. If you take our C1 cash cost of around $80 and add 
uh, current shipping rates of 28, you get to around 110. Uh, and so anything above that, the difference between 110 and 174 is um, a, a nice operating margin for a small scale iron ore miner. Uh, we see future opportunities to bring our costs down based on volume uh, opportunities. Next slide, thanks. So that building on our June quarterly performance, if you then go back to our performance from first production, I mentioned we've produced 3 million tonnes and it's been very successful uh, and we're looking forward to publishing full year results uh, for what we think is going to be another great year. Uh, we've had a very generous dividend policy, which originally was put in place to, uh, which dictated that we would pay 50 to 80% of net profit after tax as a fully franked dividend to shareholders. We've recently updated that policy just to remove those guidelines to say that we'll consider a dividend based on our full year profit performance, bearing in mind the availability of franking credits and also the growth funding requirements of the business. And uh, that's obviously, it was appropriate when we started the business and the discipline that was implemented, uh, we wanted to reward our shareholders. And we're now the board is uh, cognizant that we're balancing the exciting growth opportunities we have, and I'll talk about those in the rest of this presentation. They are going to require funding. We're very confident that they will build greater returns to shareholders. Uh, and when we look at the full year profit number and decide the dividend, we'll also be looking at the outlook on the investment required to build uh, those future businesses for Phoenix, which is both future iron ore production as well as future logistics provision, and make sure that we maintain a really strong balance sheet and have the available funds as we need them uh, to build um, greater returns for shareholders. So a minor update to the dividend policy. The board uh, are all large shareholders and we remain committed to rewarding shareholders, both through dividends, but also through capital growth these great results in the first 28 months. And so congratulations to our team across Phoenix. Uh, we have a small team um, across our mining haulage and port operations. And, and this slide shows just how well they've done since we started this mining operation 28 months ago. Next slide, thanks. Uh, here's the port of Geraldton. That's berth five, where we load our iron ore onto Panamax boats. Beautiful day you can see in Geraldton. Uh, behind the boat there is Shed 5, which we've recently acquired uh, from Mount Gibson. Uh, the state government in last year's budget in Western Australia has allocated $350 million to expand the existing port of Geraldton. That uh, is going to achieve a number of things, but it's very significant for bulk exporters like Phoenix. It's going to increase the efficiency of the port and the capacity of the port. That investment by the state government has been motivated by the, the, uh, their belief that there's an extra 10 or more million tonnes of bulk commodity to come out of the Midwest. That's a very exciting opportunity for Phoenix as a very successful logistics provider what we've shown at Iron Ridge is that we can unlock the value in Midwest projects, specifically our iron ore project and perhaps other, other iron ore projects, but there's a broader opportunity with logistics for spodumene producers, vanadium producers, titanium producers, potash producers, talc, garnet, manganese and iron ore. Uh, Third-party logistics will become a big part of Phoenix's future. Next slide, thanks. Okay, back to Iron Ridge. You can see the beauty of our ore body there. It's that dark strip, unfortunately, a little bit of shadow, but you can see it in the foreground there. Uh, that's the ore. So there's no ribbons in this pit. It's a really simple mining operation. One digger, three trucks. Macca are our mining contractor, uh, and we have a very rich high-grade ore body that we're very efficiently mining, uh, three to one strip ratio, and uh, we've got a good runway ahead of us here of five years of mining to continue. Great product. Next slide. We recently announced the acquisition of Mount Gibson's Midwest infrastructure, and this is a game changer for the business I've been describing at Phoenix. It's a $25 million transaction, $10 million of cash, and $15 million of equity. So Mount Gibson uh, has a shareholding in Phoenix of about 9%. Uh, we're very proud of our achievements at Iron Ridge, but the most successful Midwest iron ore mine and by some considerable distance over the last 20 years has been Mount Gibson. They produced 50 million tonnes from Talleran Peak and Extension Hill. And they did that by using a combination of haulage and rail access 
uh, and very efficient port storage facilities. So in this transaction, we've acquired the Shine Iron Ore Mine, 15 million tonnes of iron ore resources. Uh, Mount Gibson uh, invested in the pre-strip of that mine and had it operational in 2021 when they put it on care and maintenance. Uh, very exciting shovel-ready opportunity uh, for Phoenix, Mount Gibson acquired that mine for $14 million in 2011. They've invested more than $30 million to get it to uh, fully permitted shovel ready stage. Uh, we think it's a fantastic lookalike project to Iron Ridge and one that presents us with a fantastic opportunity to increase our production. We also acquired the two rail sidings that Mount Gibson had developed, one at Riverdini, you can see on the map there, and one at Peringery. They give access to the bulk haulage rail system in the Midwest. It then connects to the Port of Geraldton, where we've acquired two very large sheds to add to the existing shed that we own and operate using uh, Iron Ridge ore. Um, the replacement value of those on-wharf storage facilities at Geraldton is more than $80 million. So uh, you can see why we're very excited by this transaction. It's a very it's a good transaction for Mount Gibson. This was latent infrastructure uh, residual to their needs after closing their operations at Tuller and Peak and Extension Hill. Um, but for Fenix, it's an absolute game changer. In, in very important rail access infrastructure, uh, a significant expansion of our iron ore resources and production opportunities, and a hugely competitive position at the port of Geraldton, which we're looking to use for our expanded iron ore operations and for third party logistics. Next slide, thanks. Okay, a uh, little bit of pictorial about the uh, assets we've acquired. Rail siding on the left there. These, these are sidings which obviously provide access to the rail system, uh, but also it consists of freehold land assets uh, that are perfect for laydown opportunities for iron ore, blending opportunities for iron ore, uh, and other consolidation activities. So they represent uh, haulage points as well as rail access points. Um, uh, very difficult to build, expensive to integrate into the system, and they're existing uh, and uh, readily available for uh, Phoenix and also other users. The Sedge at Geraldton are magnificent pieces of infrastructure. You can see on the right-hand photo there, those two figures give you some idea of the scale. They're not even in the back of that, what is Shed 5. Uh, for someone of my background, to give it some scale, you can fit two rugby fields end-to-end -end inside Shed 5, and you could play rugby in them uh, concurrently. They're um, uh, very efficient and, uh, as I mentioned, uh, have access to the rail unloading facility as well as connections to our existing side tipping loadout that we're using for Iron Ridge. The Shine Iron Ore open pit mine there, um, you can see the ore in the pit there and you can see just how shovel ready this project is. This photo is from 2021, um, but the Mount Gibson have run a very efficient care and maintenance uh, project. The only real infrastructure we need to get this mine started is the mobilisation of a crushing and screening plant. Uh, and that would, we would see that as a similar scale operation to what we've run at Iron Ridge. Um, there are a whole range of other assets we've acquired as part of this deal, including the mining camp and Extension Hill, a very large crushing plant at Extension Hill, uh, and a whole lot of assets. It's a, it's a great collection of infrastructure for Phoenix. Next slide, thanks. Our ownership of infrastructure mine to port, very important. Uh, we have 30 prime movers and uh, Western Australian built and uh, proprietary system of quad haul road trains. They're very impressive bits of infrastructure. We carry 140 tonnes in what is a 200 tonne quad road trade, 65 metres long. Uh, it's a state of the art business that deserves its own presentation, uh, but we are delivering best of industry haulage numbers. Uh, a rule of thumb in iron ore transport on road is try and beat 10 cents a tonne kilometre and you're doing well. We're currently beating six cents a tonne kilometre. It's a step change in the industry. You can see in this photograph just how um, well-placed our shed infrastructure is. We've increased our capacity at the port by more than 400% with the acquisitions of Shed 4 and Shed 5. Uh, these are um, the infrastructure that we own on 25-year uh, lease arrangements with the Midwest Port Authority, and it provides us access to Berth 4 and Berth 5. Uh, and th those sheds are connected to the rail system that I mentioned. So we're very excited about this infrastructure. Next slide, thanks. 
I'll run through some other details on Phoenix. Um, these dots are projects that either have reserves or resources or infeasibility study change um, within haulage distance of Geraldton. I mentioned the commodities that these projects represent is lithium, spodumene, vanadium, titanium, potash, iron ore, base metals, talc, garnet, silica sands. Uh, and all of these projects require logistic solutions. They've, uh, if they're successful in developing their projects, they've got to get their product from the mine uh, to the port, and then they've got to get it into a boat. Uh, we're doing that very successfully from Iron Ridge, and we want to offer a comprehensive solution for all of these dots, uh, if and when they're ready, that we will pick up their material at the mine site and we'll deliver it to a boat. And we believe we can do that uh, at very good margins for Phoenix at a price that is better than anything that they can achieve either themselves or from third party. And we're in discussions with a number of those parties. And so stay tuned for the next step of Phoenix's growth and rewarding of shareholders is uh, a strong margin business by third party logistics based on our infrastructure. Next slide. Uh, we believe that our logistics solutions uh, is built on the strength of the Phoenix Newhall business. Uh, it, I mentioned earlier, it's a state-of-the-art business. It's also a good example of what Phoenix does very well in partnerships. This was originally a joint venture um, with Craig Mitchell's Newhall. Uh, we now own 100% of Phoenix Newhall and Craig Mitchell is the largest shareholder in Phoenix and uh, a key director of the company, along with myself and Larry Plowright. Next slide, thanks. I'll wind up pretty quickly here. We've got a great training facility at Geraldton. Um, the Kickstart Trading Academy is, is taking young Indigenous um, locals and teaching them how to drive these trucks in a state-of-the-art simulator, the only kind in the world. Uh, and then we're making these um, a youth program ready to get behind the wheel of a Phoenix truck. Next slide. Uh, I'm very proud of our... Um, community partnerships with Clontarf and others in the Midwest, and particularly as the naming sponsor of the Phoenix Buccaneers basketball side, uh, delighted that they're in the NBL one grand final this weekend, Saturday night, playing the Joondalup Wolves. Uh, and so we wish the Phoenix Buccaneers all the best for uh, another Phoenix success. Next slide. We've obviously got high value products, clean steel. We've started a number of indigenous businesses. The Wadjuri Yamaji are our key partner. We mine in a very sensitive part of the world. And again, there's a whole separate presentation of just how successful that partnership is unlocking value for Phoenix, but also value for the Wadjuri Yamaji in terms of training, reward uh, and royalties. Um, strategic pathway I've mentioned, we're going to continue to expand our own order, um, production opportunities. We're going to provide third party logistics and we're going to look for other uh, commodity exposure. Uh, quick summary corporately is on the next slide. We have a $200 million market cap. We've got $76 million in cash. Uh, we pay a nice dividend with 30 cents. We're primed for growth. I know we're not a lithium or battery metal producer, but if you listened here at Diggers and Dealers to the opening keynote speech, it, it continues a theme, don't bet against China. Uh, battery metals are all about wealth creation, emerging middle classes in the Asian economies. All of that is a derivative of steel production. We're going to continue to see strong margins for Phoenix for our iron ore operations and demand for base metals only leads to greater logistics opportunities in the Midwest. We're incredibly excited about that. We've demonstrated we're a successful company. Uh, we have a very low EV. If you want to invest in a company that makes money, that's real, that has people doing good business and building great partnerships uh, and is primed for a significant growth, then get on board, Phoenix. Uh, always enjoy questions from shareholders uh, and look forward to yours, David. Thanks, John. A great presentation. Great. And um, as you say, investors love companies that make money and grow uh, and uh, uh, have a clear strategy for that growth. And I just want to ask a question on that um, in regards to the acquisitions that you've made. Is Phoenix a logistics company with an iron ore business, an iron ore business with a logistics company? And, and how, do you, how does the third party logistics strategy unfold? Well, look, we're, I think we're an iron ore miner with a logistics capability. Uh, and uh, I, I don't see any um, issue with understanding that business. The easiest, one of the easiest things we do, and we do it very well, is our iron ore mine. It's one digger and three trucks. We've got a great team out there uh, led by Chris Tuckwell, former managing director of Macca Mining. 
Uh, and those guys have done a great job in managing our strip ratio and in uh, producing that really great product. But, but the real key to unlocking value from an iron ore body 500 kilometres from Geraldton is not hard to work out. It's logistics. Our largest cost component was always going to be haulage. It's more than two and a half times the cost of our mining activity. Uh, and then port access for iron ore developers and operators is crucial. So we're already a logistics company. The value we've unlocked from Phoenix. Uh, hasn't been as much from our mining as it has been from managing the costs of our haulage and our port. So the ability to do that for ourselves is is quite simply translated to the ability to do it for other people. We have a distinct business unit that does both of those. So we have three business units, mining, headed by Chris Tuckwell, haulage, headed by Craig Mitchell and Jamie South, and our port operations, uh, headed up by Adrian Third and, and managed by Jamie Jones in Geraldton. Uh, now, all of those three of those, at the moment, the haulage and the port guys are really contractors for our mining guys. And so whether they were working to haul iron ore from uh, Iron Ridge or you know, another bulk commodity, let's call it lithium spodumene from another customer, uh, that's really an ind a separate business unit. It's easy to see us providing those services for others. Uh, and to answer your question, I, I think we're a miner uh, with logistics cap capability and we want to make uh, rewards for our shareholders across all three of those business units. A, uh, a distinct strategic advantage, having, as you say, three distinct business units that all operate in unison and can provide a lot of opportunity for shareholders and also the company in its own haulage operations. So, John, we're out of time, but a great presentation, a, clearly a company uh, that sits on a lot of people's watch lists based on the number of people watching today, but also focused on profits, focused on growth, focused on dividends. We love to see it and shareholders will love to see it also. So, John, thanks for your time. Thanks very much, David. Last but by no means least, I'd like to introduce Stuart Tarrant, CFO of Lithium Australia, ASX code LIT. Yesterday, the company definitely lit up the market, pun intended, announcing the signing of a joint development agreement with major ASX-listed mining company Mineral Resources, stock up over 55% on the news and up again today. Stuart, we look forward to hearing more about it. Over to you. Thanks, David. Uh, really pleased to be able to provide an update today. Um, so a bit of a different slide pack to what you've just seen. We, uh, we've now exited the, the mining business, but really happy to take you through some of the progress we've made. Uh, next slide, please. So where do we play? We play in the battery uh, materials industry now. This, uh, this industry is going to grow significantly uh, over the next you know, 10, 20 years, and it's growing as we speak. Um, you know, we've got some really, really critical technologies which we're looking to develop uh, over the next uh, few years. Um, and you know, there's, there's this uh, supply chain shift that we've seen. I know uh, John just mentioned around uh, China being a demand for, for battery materials, and that's absolutely spot on. Uh, but there's a, there's a big desire for lots of jurisdictions around the world to decouple uh, supply chains away from uh, the reliance that's, that's on, uh, on China. And, and probably the biggest thing, and, and we'll cover some of this as we go through, the slides is, you know, we, we've identified that partners are a critical part of uh, our development path. Uh, next slide. So this is a simplified view of the uh, lithium battery supply chain. So on, on the left there, you've got your, your miners. Uh, we do have some investments still in, uh, in some companies, as you can see. Uh, and that's really just a legacy of our, our starting life, which was an explorer uh, back in the day. So we've now decoupled all of our um, primary holdings in, 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 um, in projects. So we do have some uh, listed investments, uh, but very much driven uh, towards uh, lithium chemicals and through to, to materials. Um, so let's start with um, our leader technology. So this is the, uh, the technology we announced yesterday. Um, this, this technology we've now secured MinRes uh, as a partner. Uh, so really pleased. Uh, really pleased to have someone of that credence, um, you know, have a look over uh, our technology and come in and, um, and partner with us and help fund that, um, that that technology. And it's a very disruptive technology. So, you know, what we're seeking to do here is take a, a spodumene mine and improve the recovery. So, um, you know, it's a, uh, it doesn't use a, a thermal process, it's a caustic process. 
Uh, so we're able to be quite selective on uh, recovery of lithium. Um, and what that means is you get you know, the potential to take a, a lithium uh, recovery from 60% to 90%. So very, very big for the miners, not only from a cost perspective, but also a sustainability perspective. Um, because of the way that the technology works, it doesn't need to be on a, uh, you know, a very high quality um, uh, material out of the mine. We can work on low grade and we can also work on, uh, on um, you know, waste materials as well. Um, so where we are with that technology, um, yeah, we'll, we'll look to, to, to kick off our pilot, piloting this year uh, and get to a development plant in the, in the next few years. Then you move further downstream. Um, so the, the LENA technology that, that will produce a, a chemical called lithium phosphate. Uh, and that's a, a precursor material that goes into cathode, cathode active materials. Um, VSPC is the, the brand we have for our cathode, cathode active materials business. Uh, we focus on lithium ferrophosphate and lithium manganese ferrophosphate. So they're a much safer, cheaper um, variant of the, the materials that you've got historically. Um, and we've been doing this a long time. So, um, you know, getting into 20 years now of developing nanotechnology, um, but absolutely taking that next step in the next 12 months to increase our, uh, our capacity um, from our one to two tonnes a year over in, um, uh, over in Brisbane. We don't play in, down in the cell manufacturing and the, and the EV space. Um, you know, we observed that there's a very high capital cost. And I think, you know, the, the technology does take a long time to, to get right in those areas. So we, we're definitely partnering with those um, uh, those industries, but we're not going to uh, move into that space. Um, but we do work in the recycling. So when a lithium ion battery is at the end of its life, or as we've seen over the last few years, they um, they become available due to a recall. Um, then you know, we have volumes of, of batteries to recycle. We strip those batteries um, out into their various components. So uh, the steel, copper, aluminium, um, but really what we're looking to get our hands on is the uh, the active materials in the battery, which is called mixed metal dust or black mass. Um, and then we sell that on for refining and it goes back into the, the battery industry. So, you know, we'd lead the market here in Australia uh, through, through Enviroscreen. Um, and, you know, we've got some very safe um, mechanisms to, uh, to continue to grow over the next few years. Next slide, please. So where are we in the industry? Um, we're in a we're in a market that's just going gangbusters at the moment, to be, to be quite frank. Um, you know, the outlooks um, for any demand uh, seem to be uh, increasing for as you would go through one quarter to the next quarter. Um, there is a shift in, in chemistry. So the, the second slide, um, uh, second graph, sorry, to the left, um, which shows uh, NMC, LFP, NCA. Um, you can see that uh, the share of lithium ferrophosphate cathode materials will, will increase. Uh, between now and 2030, we're already seeing that coming, and we are also developing the next the next phase of lithium ferrophosphate uh, powders, which is lithium manganese ferrophosphate cathode powders. Um, and then on the uh, you know the right right hand side, you see you know where we've got quite a small operation for recycling at this point in time. Um, you know, by the time you get to 2030. 2040, the volumes in, in Australia are going to be very significant. Uh, so we need to be prepared for those volumes because there's no one else in the market at this point in time who's able to, to do what we do. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the geopolitical shift um, you know, through the US um, Inflation Reduction Act and you know, other, other jurisdictions around the world. Uh, we're seeing a lot of investment in companies to, uh, to have a... Uh, a product that's made either in the country or through partner uh, partner countries and um, through the US, U EU, Canada and, and, and Australia, we've seen some significant commitments. Um, you know, we're looking to leverage those commitments and, you know, specifically for our cathode active material uh, business, we we see the US as a, as a key growth market for us. Um, and we'll focus on you know, developing partners and taking ourselves into that, into that market as quickly as possible. And this slide, please. So what are our plans and, and what have we achieved so far? So um, these are the three technology platforms we have. So lithium chemicals, cathode materials and recycling um, and some of our targets. So for, for FY24, um, which we've just started, 
Uh, we've we've set ourselves some target to you know, find a development partner for our cathode active materials. Uh, sorry, for our lithium chemicals business, which we've we've achieved uh, as announced yesterday. Um, and we want to start the the piloting, which will happen in this half of of this calendar year. Um, for our cathode active materials, uh, very much a case of uh, building our partners either from a an offtake or raw material perspective, but also uh, getting to a point where we can build a a larger facility. And then for our, our recycling business is very much about uh, improving the, the operational um, effectiveness of that, of that business, getting through to cash flow positive. And then once we've got it to that position, then we'll start to grow nationally and internationally. Um, and then within uh, Lithium Australia as a group. So um, I think we acknowledge um, that we, we need to be prepared for, for quite significant growth over the next few years. And so we're putting the foundations in um, over this year to ensure that when we grow, uh, we can grow sustainably. Um, over the next few years, so where we, where we see you know, say, uh, two to three years time, I think we'll have a demonstration plant um, for our lithium chemicals technology. We would hope that um, mineral resources would, would um, fund that and have that on their own uh, facility. And we'd just license the technology through to it. Uh, from a offtake perspective, uh, we we'll, would have secured our offtake uh, and then we'll be in a position where we'll, we'll build a demonstration plant. Uh, and then for for Envirostream, we're seeing you know, significant increases in volumes already. Uh, so yeah, just to give an example, last year we received uh, 1.1 uh, of 1,100 tons of of, um, of batteries uh, into Envirostream in, in FY22, and in FY23 it's approximately 15 1,500 tons. So we are seeing you know, significant growth year on year. And the, the mix of those batteries is shifting towards uh, lithium ion batteries as well, which is which is useful. Next slide, please. So I mentioned about our, our partnership. So very key for us to, to make sure we've got the right partners to grow our business. <clears throat> I've spent a bit of time going through uh, the deal we did with Mineral Resources, which we've, we've announced yesterday. So um, we've got a, uh, a joint development agreement with Mineral Resources. They'll provide four and a half million dollars through a convertible note um, to get through piloting and a uh, an engineering study for for our Lena technology. Uh, we'll put in our uh, our IP effectively and our, our know how into that into that joint venture to the extent that um, uh, the the results are, are positive, which there's no reason why we can't see it. There's not. Um, then we would look to license that um, that technology out to to a number of different operators and, and juniors for that matter around the world. Uh, clearly, uh, when you can take a, a recovery of lithium from 60 to 90%, it's, it's very, very positive. And yeah, that's one of the reasons why we've been able to secure uh, such a significant partner like Mineral Resources. Um, yeah, they've been very open with us around uh, the, the scope of the technology um, and yeah, very, very keen to see them deploy the technology on their operations and, and uh, you know, outside of, of their operations. Um, in terms of cathode active materials, so one of our partners uh, is Nephonics. Uh, they did some test work on our product earlier on this year and uh, you know, tested our product against some of the key products in the world, um, and it stacks up very well, the, the cathode active material from, from our operations. Um, uh, in addition to, to Nephonics, we're also working with uh, cell manufacturers, uh, so gigafactories effectively around around the world um, to come up with some commercial arrangements there, either from offtake or development perspective. And it's actually one of the reasons why Simon Ninjow, our new CEO, uh, is unable to make today's call. Um, so he's he's up in Korea at the moment, just having some of those early conversations with uh, with parties over there. And then the battery cycling business. I mean, clearly we've got a national footprint. So doing that on our own, with being such a small companies is quite challenging. So to have the, the network of a Bunnings or Efforts Works um, is, is very important for us. Um, yeah, we don't just deal in the, in the small handheld batteries. We also deal in the large format batteries and that's where we want to move to. Uh, we're seeing significantly more batteries coming in through um, the EVs and energy storage systems. And yeah, we, uh, we have a partner in um, LG Energy Solution who um, uh, gave us a, quite a large volume of uh, energy storage systems uh, over the last 12 months. Next slide, please. And here's just a summary of, of us. So you know, clearly the result yesterday um, was received positively by the market, um, but you know, 
we don't need to go out and raise money. Uh, we've got a strong balance sheet, as you can see there on the left-hand side, um, strong cash position, strong listed investment uh, position, um, three technologies which you know, we believe are, have a significant role to play in the, in the lithium-ion battery supply chain in the, in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and for now, it's really just about taking those technologies forward. Thanks, David. Over to you. Thanks, Stuart. Great presentation. And uh, as you mentioned, the market clearly excited yesterday by the news of the agreement with Mineral Resources. Um, just to sort of step back a little bit, um, what's the process that you went through in terms of finding a partner for Lena and, and the time and the due diligence and the things that you had to go through to, to get to an, a, a stage of making an announcement and make a sort of formalising an agreement to then move forward? Yeah, so it's a great question. And actually, it's a really important one for us because we we had committed to the pilot plant uh, a while ago. And what we, what we did uh, about 12 months ago now is take a pause to find a partner. Uh, we were getting to a point where we felt like there could be a commercial partner such as Mineral Resources to, to come in. Um, and it's a two-year journey um, of us engaging with, uh, with the technical teams, uh, ensuring that they're comfortable, making sure they've done their test work. Um, yeah, we've run... Um, mineral resources uh, materials through um, uh, on a lab uh, on a bench scale, sorry, um, all the way through to a lithium ferrophosphate cathode pad, actually. So, yeah, we've got some pretty smart technologies that can interface. Um, so, yeah, when we were able to prove to mineral resources what the recovery is, potential recovery of um, their their um, lithium through uh, through his technology, and and we're not just producing aspartamine concentrate as well. I think it's important to to realise that you know, for, from a miner, you get you know, an increase in recovery if you mine, but you also move downstream. So we're producing a lithium chemical, not a spot concentrate. Um, so they're, they're already moving down the supply chain, uh, which is yeah, very important for some like minerals. Um, but you know, throughout all the engagement, very positive, uh, very open. Um, I think they, they acknowledge that um, yeah, the piloting is, a, is an important step for us. Um, so, and that's why they funded uh, all of the piloting and providing material available to, to complete the test work. And just on the next steps, I know you did touch on it, but to reiterate, what are the next steps? What are the, what are the milestones shareholders and, and potential shareholders should be looking at to, as, as the milestones to, to follow? Yeah, so, so first of all, it will be um, getting the piloting up and away. So we expect to have that uh, starting um, this year. So we're just working with Ansto at this point in time to find a, a slot available for them to, to execute the work. So that's where all of our test work has happened in the past. Once the piloting is finished, uh, very much through to a point where we can continue to um, uh, look towards a demonstration plant. So we'll... we'll um, commence an engineering study for, for the technology, which will inform um, MinRes as to the, the size and scope of, of that material, of that equipment, sorry, um, to enable, hopefully, them to, uh, to develop that plant on their sites and, um, and you know, truly demonstrate the commercial uh, ability of the, of, the, uh, of the technology. After that, it's very much a case of licensing the technology out to mineral resources, uh, but also to, to third parties as well. So there's no limit on who this technology could go to, um, but at this point in time, given our technology readiness, it's not possible to, uh, to license the technology. And you touched on in your presentation, a number of, of your, your sort of key um, parts of the business are at or nearing partnering stage, which you know, the, the MinRes deal is clearly one key milestone in that regard in relation to Lena. But how advanced are partnering discussions across the other parts of the business? Obviously, um, nothing's been disclosed, so you can't talk too deeply into them. But, you know, are you, are you seeing the, the crescendo, if you like, of partner discussions starting to, to reach or be reached? Yeah, we are. I think, um, yeah, we... We've definitely seen an uptick, and, and look, I think yeah, we've had a a new CEO, Simon Lynch, come in in January. Um, he's given the organisation a sense of purpose, and so we yeah, we've we've managed to um, get rid of a little bit of noise that we may have had as an organisation in the past, and get us focused on the things that matter most, and that's partnerships ultimately for these technologies. So um, yes, I think if you look at uh, the um, the recycling business, you know, we're, we're in discussions with 
uh, major EV manufacturers um, for, uh, for agreements to secure their, their end-of-life batteries. Um, we don't expect huge volumes from those, but what we're trying to do is secure, secure those volumes as they grow into the future, David, so that you know, we're able to uh, plan for what those volumes might be and then gear up uh, or scale up, as, as Simon would say. Um, uh, and, you know, in the cathode active material, that's probably where the most interest is. So, you know, we, we're one of the few um, LFP manufacturers outside of China. Uh, uh, and actually, if we build a, uh, a demonstration plant, which is what we seek to do, we'd previously looked at uh, a pre-qualification plant, so something between 200 to 300 tonne per annum facility. But given the, the interest um, through the industry, we've, we've really increased our, our, uh, our thinking on that. So it's been more like a two to 3,000 tonne per annum facility. So, um, you know, uh, you know, when we get to that point um, of talking about a larger facility, people uh, are much more interested in offtake and, um, you know, co-development opportunities. So there's a number of things that we uh, are trying to pursue at this point in time, but nothing's definitive. Um, you know, so this will just be updated as, as things come to, uh, time to come to completion. Yeah, just touch on LFP, uh, a fellow ASX listed company, much bigger, clearly, being Pilbara Minerals, have spoken about their interest in LFP as well. Do you see that as a sign of greater competition or a greater maturity in this market? Oh, I actually just see it as a greater opportunity, um, to, to be honest. I think, yeah, there's, there's some cohorts to talk about the different chemistries and they compete against each other. But the reality is there's a struggle to find enough um, minerals and materials to, to provide, uh, you know, satisfactory amounts and quality uh, to build the, the EV and ESS um, applications in the next few years. So, you know, if people are interested, I think that's, that's good because someone needs to. We believe it's a great chemistry because it's a lot safer. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's cheaper. We've got our own proprietary process. So we are able to uh, produce this without coming across anyone else's IP. Um, and you know, we're the only ones in Australia producing LFP at the, at the moment. And you know, as I mentioned, globally, uh, there's, there's, there's a handful of small companies outside of China that can produce this, this material. So from a geopolitical perspective, we're, we're actually very attractive. And finally, EnviroStream, activities clearly advancing. Is the focus on getting to a cash flow break-even point or growing the footprint to take advantage of the opportunity? Uh, both, yeah. So I think what 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 we what we're focused on today is is building a sustainable model. So you know, turning a um, a startup uh, recycling business into a manufacturing business. So we've started to recruit um, uh, you know the right management roles for that. Um, Simon Lynch has got a a manufacturing background as well, so he brings a high degree of credence into into that organisation. He's based in Melbourne, um, so which is where all of our recycling facilities are. Um, so yeah, we'll look to improve our commercial uh, outcomes, increase our um, operational efficiencies, which will lower our costs. That'll get us through cash flow positive, and then we'll look to grow uh, you know, nationally and, and also internationally. So you know, as part of our, our conversations, uh, invariably someone that's looking at cathode materials might also be looking at uh, end of life solutions as well, because if they're cell manufacturers, um, then you know, they've, they've, they, they like to begin with a battery make, but also uh, what happens at the end of, end of life. A diverse portfolio, but clearly linked to the battery metal space and the EV revolution. Clear strategy, partnerships dropping into place, exciting times ahead for Lithium Australia and its shareholders. Stuart, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Cheers. As I said in my introduction, the purpose of this webinar series is to give you the opportunity to engage directly with companies that are on your watch list and to give you ideas of companies you might want to potentially add to your watch list so you can follow them in the future. So look at your watch list. Let us know if there are any companies on there you want to hear from, or let us know about companies you've been thinking about adding to your watch list, and we'll get them to present to you in the future. Thank you to the presenters for making the time to present, and for you, and to you, sorry, for watching. We'll see you again in two weeks' time. Have a great day.